on sign-up days, make sure we sign up. So thanks for coming in tonight. I wanted to call and uh, gather you. We haven't had a big meeting like this in a while. So thanks for doing it. Uh, the few of you I haven't had a chance to meet yet, I'm Father Dennis Spees. I'm completing my fourth year as pastor of the school in St. Laborious Parish and St. Mary Parish in Park Forest. And so it's been a, an honor and a privilege to be here. And it isn't a lot. But we all do that, don't we? So thank you for making your sacrifices in time. I wanted to offer a reminder of one of our big topics tonight, as you see up front, is fundraising. It's a big part of who we are, and it's a big part of what we do, and I just want to offer a reminder to say why we do fundraising at all. I've had people ask me that, Father, just raise tuition, I don't have to do all this extra stuff. So I just wanted a name of clarity. The reason we do fundraising is to provide help so that you don't have to come up with it all. You can still choose to come up with it all. But if we're trying to do what it, you know, like if we're scraping it to try to make our tuition payments or this year's budget is tight, wish we could find a way to come up with some money, well, we like to try to provide opportunities for that. The other side of that coin, and this is a huge point, is there's a lot of people in the community that want to support the school. They can't wait for you to ask them to support the school. There's businesses that want to support the school. The parishes do support the school. And when we go out and ask people to knock on their door, hey, I, I go to Mother Teresa Catholic Academy, and you know we're really making a difference in this community. There's a couple hundred families here who are being impacted. Would you be willing to help us? And it could be my, my, my child selling candy bars. You want a box of them? <laughs> or whatever it is you're up to. Raffle tickets. But we want to provide the opportunity for you to look for ways to get help. That's to help your budget. So I, I wanted to put that out there. That's the reason we do fundraising. So that to, it gives the community an opportunity to support the school. And we as families are transitional. We go, you know, we participate as the school family, and then we grow up, we go on to high school, and our students go on to high school, and but the school remains, and the community remains. And so the people that have seen this school grow for the last 100 years, or 85 years, or the last four years, they like it. They like that the school is here. They like to know that somebody's making a difference for the students in their community. And they want to support the school. So I wanted to give you that encouragement to say, do not shamefully go and, well, we're trying to raise money. Would you please help? They want to help. And so they do. In case you need a testimony for that, please notice the big addition on the south side of the school. Did you notice that that wasn't there before? In case you're new to the school, that big section that doesn't look like it belongs to the building, it's new. And it did not come from your tuition. The community put it there. Because they want it there. And they're excited for you. And so I wanted to put that out there to remind us all why we do what we do. And so now I want to share through the diocese, the diocese of Joliet, who we are a part of. They, they remind us and coach us a lot in running schools. And they tell us, we strongly recommend that 10% of your entire budget be from generosity for the community. So our budget is about $1.4 million. We're trying to see what we can do about spending one3 But since our budget was one4 last year, we set our fundraising goal at $150,000. Just because I like to like, let's raise the bar, let's try to get to it. But I have to confess to you, what we ended up doing was getting out the calculator, and one of the moms, actually a couple of people from the teams I've introduced to you earlier approached me and said, Father, if we all do what you're asking us to do, we're going to raise $78,000. Does that sound, that's not effective, is it? So there's a side of me that wants to apologize to you for setting our goals the way we did, because now we're setting ourselves up for failure. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit, but... $78,000 isn't going to make it if our goal is one fifty. dollars And there's fun ways 
to do fundraising. And we're trying hard to make sure we do those. We're trying to remove what I call the, the grinding wheel. I'm kind of, I'm, uh, I grew up farming, so I use farming images a lot, but the grinding wheel is the non-fun approach of we have to do something, but I like to have fun events, activities that allow us to participate and get to know each other, have celebrations together. So all of you that were at this year's gala, it's a great event to get to know each other. We had almost 300 people there. And uh, the community also wanted to come and meet you. And they do, they come and say, I want to meet some of the school families that were supporting. And you'll see a graph in a little bit that says, our tuition covers about 78% of our bills. That means 22% comes from somewhere else. So it comes from fundraising, and it comes from the support of a couple of parishes, St. Laborious, St. Mary, a couple of other parishes sometimes participate, but they provide at least 10% of our budget. And so I have good accountability and responsibility to them. It would be great to have them see us really working at hard and surpassing our goals. So I just wanted to say that's tonight's goal is to make sure we understand that fundraising is very helpful for the community and for you and to continue to study ways and look for ways to help out. One said he wants to take a survey and you know, do we participate in these or are you aware of them or do we participate anyway? But you're the ones here participating and making it great. So I want to thank you for that. And so Mrs. Murray is going to present the development of what all we've been talking about. I'd like to share with you and invite you to know for sure that the teams that stood up, they've been processing several ideas about what we propose to you for next year. We went through a, a couple of ideas, and then we added a couple more ideas, then we added four more ideas. So please know that these have been thoroughly thought through and processed. We had we numbered them proposal one through seven, and number five was five and five B, and then we added a number eight. So I just wanted to let you know that many of these proposals that have been studied and looked through, and we're going to propose one of them. I guess I'm going to say I hope you like it. It's going to be uh, opportunities for some fun, and so I'll give you my door, Mrs. Murray. She's got it all planned out. So thank you very much for coming in. I'm proud that you're coming in to figure out what's going on and how to help. And uh, I, I do have one more, one more, one of my dreams that we haven't started yet is to systematically invite our businesses to support the community school of Mother Teresa Catholic Academy. And so we're calling it the uh, sponsorship program. And as you know, we always go and hit companies up for donations throughout the year. You know, we hit the, I don't know how often we hit four or five of our businesses up over and over and over and over, right? We keep going to them and they're like, oh, I gave last week. So what we're going to try to do is be systematic about that. And so if you have any interest in sales at all, I want to invite you to consider signing up for this team. We're going to try to blanket the entire area systematically asking them to support this school. And so Julie Smith is sitting right in the middle of the room. Please stand up for me real quick. So we're going to take a good look. She's going to spin around. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. She's modeling her new sweater. And if you have any interest in sales at all, we're going to have about 120 businesses to call on. And we're going to ask her to make a chart and a map. And then she's going to ask you who you want to call on that you know. And then we're going to organize our approach to systematically seeking out sponsorship from a whole bunch of businesses throughout the area. Please do not be shy because we need you. And then and this is a big team. We're going to need at least 20 people to be on this team so that we can all last, you know, 15 places and we'll get them covered. So I just wanted to introduce Julie before you and please help her out and cheer her on. And, uh, and if you have, again, if you have any interest in sales at all, if you know somebody who does who's not here, please make sure and give your name to Julie. She's carrying a sheet of paper, a pen, and she is prepared to make a big long list with your name on it, willing to help her out. So thank you, Julie, for stepping out in that endeavor. And so right now, Julie is starting from scratch. As you would imagine, she needs a team. So if you're willing to help her with the administration part or the sales part, please make sure you contact her and have make sure
sure she has your name to ask for help. So here we go. And Mrs. Murray, we're having a great first year with her. So uh, please. Big blue chunk right here. It's 
3.8%. That is salaries and benefits for teachers. That seems like a huge chunk of it, but if you knew how little they made, this part here, which is also related to this, are the benefits. Now, when I brought these numbers up to a few other people, several people have said, well, we want to get cut teachers to part-time. Well, there are a few facts that you should know. We do have teachers that are part-time, about half the staff is. But well, one of the things that you should know is even my part-time teachers work full-time hours, even though they know they're not getting paid for it, because they know there's a job to be done. That's not something that I do a lot, and perhaps I should, but the teachers who are in this building are firmly and absolutely dedicated to this school, and they do a good job.
3%, the holiday brochure and butter braids were 2% each, and Target, which is what Sharon King refers to as the mindless fundraising, that was another 2%. So there are a lot of people doing a lot of work, but again, it's not getting us there because this chunk is what's not meant. Now you look at a piece of pie, you say 27%, that's not too bad. That 27% represents almost $42,000. So 27% is a big chunk. This is participation from you. And I asked Tina Lecoq to work up these numbers because I think it's important to see them. She also gave me notes of them, Tina. We have 180 families, and that's what this chart is based on, is the 180 families. 95 families, which represents 53%, 95 of our families went above and beyond what we asked with the $400 loan. Thank you for that. We also had six, no, excuse me, the surplus that the 95 families brought in was $13,403. We had nine families who exactly, that's 5% here, who exactly hit their goals. So thank you to you also. We appreciate that immensely. This 34% chunk here represents the families who didn't meet their goal, so then that was wrapped into their final payment and facts for the year. We have 4% right here, this orange slice, which are families that did nothing. Some chose not to, they wanted to buy it out, others just said, I'm not going to do it, so the whole thing was wrapped into their tuition. This chunk here, this green piece, represents families who had less than $10 left. We chose to waive that because all those families added up together, it was only $19.10. So, because they were some of them, 52 cents short, 38 cents short. So it's not a huge chunk of change, but these are also the same families who are very actively involved in the school, most of them went over and above their, their volunteer hours, so we waived those pennies. Then we have one little chunk here, um, a family who had part of their fundraising waived because they had a disaster to follow them and they were very um, open with us and honest with us from the word go and again did volunteering and all of that above and beyond what was asked to compensate for that. So this is where the fundraising money is or is not is the case we make. So the definition of insanity I'm sure you've read it or heard it somewhere is to keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. That's what we've been doing. So we decided not to be insane anymore. And we have a solution. The solution represents months of work and research and hours and hours and hours of conversation. What we want to do is set ourselves up for success, especially in the least painful way possible. So the fundraising team and Father Dennis and I came up with a plan that will enable us to succeed. Again, for those of you who exceeded your obligation, thank you. For those of you who met your obligation, thank you. For those of you who tried to meet your obligation, thank you. All of the pennies add up. But we do have to adjust the plan so you know what's coming. Minimums are going up. But I want to explain that to you. This is what it looks like. Everybody will still have the same four tickets to sell for the raffle, which would equate to $200, okay? If you have two or more children, it's the same thing. I will explain in a moment why we tiered this. We are introducing football mania tickets. We'll explain that in detail in just a moment. Some of you I know are familiar with it because you've, you've talked with me about it. If you're not familiar, I promise we will explain it. Sharon King over there in the Navy or Bright Blue Football Media t-shirt will also be on hand to answer questions afterwards. This is where the change comes in also. If you have one child, we are asking for an additional $200 in fundraising. If you have two children, excuse me, fundraising profit. If you have two children, we're asking for an additional $300 in fundraising profit. So if you have one child, then your fundraising minimum is $700. 
If you have two or more children, it's $800. A couple of things to explain here for you. First of all, the additional fundraising profit can come from selling more football media tickets, it can come from more raffle tickets, or it can come from the other fundraisers that we will still do this year. We elected to cut out about 10 of the, the smaller ones we were doing so that we can really put our focus on the ones that are bigger and that are more successful and bring in more dollars so that those things can be even more successful. The reason that we tiered this is because when we're figuring out the budget, we're not figuring out the budget per family, we're bu budgeting per student. So the reason that we decided to tier this for one child or two or more is because we need to do a better job of meeting that budget gap. We also elected not to say one child, two children, three children, four children, because there are five families in the school who have more than two kids. So we thought, well, five isn't going to make that big a difference. So we left the tiering at one child or two children. Okay? Let me explain football mania. This is the love hate relationship. I have a video that I'll show you in a moment. I'm going to do a quick explanation of the videos better, but I have a microphone on it. What's key for us about Football Mania is above and beyond any other fundraiser we do, this is a 70% profit. 70. It's huge. Most of our fundraisers are between 10 and 15. This will cover all 17 weeks of the football season. And because of the number of tickets that we ordered, we are guaranteed at least one winner every week. These are cash prizes. Greg Lang is in the back there. He won $1,000 on football meeting. And he says he doesn't know anything about football except the fact that the ball is brown and he put it through those things. That's a <laughs> So let me show you a video. It's short, about two minutes. Okay, um, a few other things. 
things about football mania. This is kind of a no-brainer fundraiser because we don't have to track it. You'll be getting your tickets tonight. And this is what the ticket looks like, except there's a stub down here. So when someone purchases a ticket, and they're $25, when someone purchases a ticket, you just have them fill out that bottom portion. They keep this part, and then you turn in the bottom stub. And then when we activate those numbers, then you're playing. It starts with the very first week of football, goes all the way through the last week of football. So people who pray to the altar of football will love this. I don't, but people in my house do. The other thing is that Mrs. King, who was chairing this particular team, and I, we notified each week of who the winners are from Mother Teresa. So that we will be able to let you know this isn't like buying magazine subscriptions that you never see. There will be winners from the tickets that are sold by us. Okay? The other thing that, that several people on the fundraising team wanted me to bring up to you is the fact that if this goes over well and you really like this, there's also hockey mania, basketball mania, NCAA mania, baseball mania. So if we discover, if we find that, that these are easy to sell, that people like them, that you like them, we can always add in another season from another sport. Okay? And we did order extra tickets if you went through your first 12. And they are $25. The other reason that this was very attractive is that lots of people have shared that the $50 tickets are hard to sell, but they could sell $25 tickets till the cows come home. So we were trying to also address that need. So that's the fundraising part that we wanted to talk about. There's another part that I want to talk with you about. I want you to be with me. The day that Father Dennis hired me, we were sitting in a Starbucks under Lennox, and he said, I know you don't know much about the school yet, but I'd like you to dream with me. And I thought, I've only been there twice. I'm not entirely sure how to get there. <laughs> and he said, I want you to dream with me. And I said, okay. And he said, no dream is too big. And I said, okay. I had to tell my principal that I'm quitting. <laughs> and he said that to me almost weekly, that he wants me to dream with him. And after the first month, then I started doing that. He and I, what, what I, I would like to share with you, came from a conversation that he and I had multiple times, and then we decided, sitting in my office talking about it, wasn't getting us any further. So we talked to a few other people, and we've kind of reached a point where we can keep talking about it, but are we going to do something about it? Okay, and I'm one of those people that you can probably make your dreams happen. Since the day I walked in the door here, I have been overwhelmed by your children. And I'm going to get all the fun. They are phenomenal. And when I left St. Jude, I thought there will never be kids like this. Your kids have smoked St. Jude. And my daughter is still there. You know, I'm still but even when my daughter comes to visit, um, she keeps saying, Mom, it's so great here. Of course, I said, do you want to come over? And she'll say, well, no, my best friends are at St. Jude. Those kids knock down the competition across the board. 
That's what I would like to hear, rather than, where are you? Where's the creek? <laughs> One of our standardized test, jobs, test scores jumps significantly. Our scores are good. We are at or above the diocesan average across the board. And so you know the diocesan average is above the national average. So they're good, but there's a lot of room for improvement. I would like them to be great. I would like other schools to come knocking on our door saying, what are you doing that your kids are doing so well that we're not doing in our schools? High schools come out and they do presentations to the kids, 6th, 7th, and 8th graders, and say, this is our school, and this is where fabulous, and we, you should come and apply here. What I want is for the high schools to be pounding, Excuse me. <laughs> Pounding down our door saying, we want those kids in our seats. Your kids are the kids that we need. They get the seats first. Now, this is starting to happen. We have 13 eighth graders this year. It's our smallest class. But the tallest and the loudest. <laughs> Twelve of them tested at Catholic schools. Twelve of them that in. All twelve got them to the schools of their choices. Our kids tested in Mount Carmel. And I didn't have to call any of those schools and say, come on, take him. He's a great kid. I didn't have to do that. I can, because you know, I'm a but I didn't have to, because our kids are making a name for themselves. We were the crown jewel of the Diocese of Joliet. That's been my goal since I walked in, and I say it over and over again. We're on our way. Our first graders are doing second grade math. They are doing second grade math. Today, Mrs. Nowak said, just for giggles and grins, she kind of threw a little multiplication on them, and they were getting it, and they were picking it up, and they were running into the smart board to do problems. Multiply. I did that in fourth grade. They're multiplying. A month ago, and I, this is one of the things I put in one of my newsletters, a month ago, she just kind of threw multiple add-ins and multiple subtractions at her kids. She said in 10 minutes they all had, even the ones that she was worried about. That's a second grade skill. And the years not over yet. We also had 36 of our sixth and seventh graders who were chosen by Creative Communications to have their writing published. 36. That's almost every one of them. That's phenomenal. For Science Fair this year. Woo woo! <laughs> Much 
information for it as there is against it. And, and I could go on for hours about the reasons for and the reasons against. That's not what we're talking about. What we are talking about is making our kids better and smarter. So Father Dennis and I were talking about what can we do to make all those what ifs come true. What is the thing that's going to drop the brick on the gas pedal? This is why we are coming to you now. We've had conversations and conversations, we've done a little research, but at this point, we can't go anywhere without you helping us, without your input, okay? This is what we'd like to do, add six weeks to the school year. I don't mean six weeks of recess. I don't mean six weeks of summer camp. I mean six weeks to the school year, academic time, our regular school day, academic time. What does that look like? I don't know yet. That's what I need your help to figure out. There have been several suggestions made. Somebody said, well, let's do a summer session right in the middle of the summer. There were other people who have suggested doing, um, starting three weeks earlier and going three weeks later. Nothing is set in stone. This is where I need you to weigh in. We can continue in, in our um, strategic planning team and, and talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. But this is the point we need to decide, is this something we want? Is this something we want to do? Do we start planning for this? Or do we say, no, it's not for us? Because we really have reached a point now, the conversation's over with that group. So we need to give it to you. Is this where we go? Another parent that I was talking to said, well, that to intuition, I don't know. There are a lot of I don't knows yet because I didn't want to go further and start doing all kinds of work if this isn't something that you want. Okay? The kids don't know either because I know what they're all going to say. <laughs> so I didn't even tell them. I just told the teachers yesterday, and I said, think about it, chew on it. And I expected a revolt because some people get into this game because they like having their summer off. So I expected a revolt when I said six weeks, and they were kind of quiet for a minute, and then most of them said, okay, what does it look like? I said, I don't know. <laughs> I have to talk to other people first. There's a lot of planning that has to happen, so we're not thinking this is going to happen in August. There's a whole lot of planning. I just saw a few more shoulders go, phew. <laughs> I, there's no way we can pull this off. Um, one of the suggestions Father Dennis and I talked with Father, Father Belmonte, who's the superintendent of the Catholic schools, and he said, well, he's into it. And, um, you know, a week and a half, and a week and a half, and then the next year, go to three weeks and three weeks. And we both said, <coughs> and well, that one. Which is why I need you to help me figure this out. To figure out how it would work, what it would look like. The research is undeniable that kids would succeed with this, that kids would improve. The research says that kids who are functioning on the lower end of success would be fabulous with this. It gives them an opportunity to catch up. It also says that kids who are at the high end of success would do really well with all the enrichment. And it says the kids in the middle get both advantages. I've had teachers who come to me all year saying, I'd love to take the kids to this exhibit, this museum, this event, but I don't have time. This would provide them with that time. One of the chief criticisms of the American education system is that it's a mile wide and an inch deep. What I would like to do in these six weeks is make it deeper, because this is where the learning happens. This is where they take their skills and bring them to the next year next year, and it gets deeper and deeper. That's what my dream is. And again, what it'll look like, I don't know. Because I need people to help me figure this out. Okay? I need you to figure out if this is something that you want. What are other schools in the diocese doing? Well, none of them are doing it. We would be the first. So from a marketing standpoint, that's kind of awesome. But I'm not looking at this from a marketing standpoint. I'm looking at it as what's going to be best for our kids. And I think more learning time is it. How many times as parents have we looked at our kids and said, wow, school is really different than it was when I was a kid. 
And even in the 20 years I've been teaching school, it's changed. Yet we're still doing a lot of the things the same way. I'm suggesting that maybe we need to shake it up. I don't know if, if you lay people know this, but at teacher conferences all the time, they love to say, we're getting kids prepared for jobs that don't even exist yet. Which frankly scares the snot out of me. But it's true. There are jobs that exist now that didn't exist when I was in first grade, when the dinosaurs were on the earth, as I say to the kids. And actually, a few first graders have said, did you really see dinosaurs? <laughs> Okay. 
okay, fine, and I'll put that on the shelf, and I'll come up with a different dream. Trust me, I do it all the time. It drives my husband nuts. <laughs> so don't think that because I'm up here being a cheerleader for it, that I don't want to hear it if you think opposite. No, I, I need to hear it. Okay, I need to hear it. I need to know what you're thinking. 